Hello, Facebook family. Hello, YouTube family. This is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson bringing you the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, March the 22nd. We will come out of a different book this week. We're looking at Micah chapter 3, 1 through 4. And we'll go from 1 through 4 to 9 through 12. And then we'll conclude with Micah chapter 6, 6 through 8. Our title of the message is an argument against corruption, an argument against corruption. Very good topic, very good thing that's relevant for all times as we all deal with uh, corruption. But if you find out this lesson is very helpful for you or you benefit by it or you think somebody else may benefit uh, from hearing this message, please hit the like button, hit the share button. And if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. So let's get into our lesson. Our lesson deals with corruption. I want to just propose the question is that uh, what would you do or how would you act if God blessed you with wealth, God blessed you with power, would you be able to handle it? A lot of us uh, strive for wealth and power and uh, we wonder maybe why God has it given us and maybe God doesn't want to give us that temptation. Maybe God could use us better if we did not have all those distractions because having wealth and, and power can be a distraction in the Lord's work and it can be a hindrance. For some people, it's a blessing. They can handle it, not handle it, but I think for most people, the wealth and power and all that comes with it, the fame and glory can uh, sidetrack us from uh, actually blind us from doing God's will. Actually, what it does, um, it it hinders our proper view of God. It can do that. Sometimes wealth and power, it, it informs or shapes our theology, which sometimes is contrary to what uh, who God is. And that's what we're going to find out here. Uh, we're looking at a nation, or, or Israel, uh, the northern and southern kingdoms, who have been blessed by God. And their materialism, their wealth, their fame, their power have gotten the best of them. And instead of drawing them closer, it has uh, allowed them to commit all kinds of terrible sins. But let's talk, first talk about who Micah is. Uh, the Bible tells us that Micah is an eighth century prophet. Uh, he hails from the southern kingdom uh, near Judah, about 22 miles uh, southwest. The Bible tells us it's called Mor Morsheth. That's where he's from. Uh, he's not identified by his name, his given name, or his ancestral name, but he's identified where, from where he's located. Where he's located is very rural, very poor, and this allows him to be an effective prophet in preaching to the north and southern kingdoms. So uh, we know that about him. He's an eighth century uh, prophet, contemporary of Hosea, Isaiah. Um, and also he served under three kingships. Uh, the first one was Jotham. Second one was Ahaz. The last one was Hezekiah. That was a span of about 25 to 28 years. So he served for a very long time. Also in line with our other lessons, uh, Habakkuk and Amos, he is also a minor prophet. Uh, just He does seven chapters here and very short read. And so he's not minor in the quality of what he produced. It's very powerful. Uh, he's just uh, minor in the quantity, not the quality, but the quantity of what is written. There are no such things as minor prophets. All of them are major because God has chosen them to proclaim his word at a particular point in time to a particular set of people. So that's what we know about him. Uh, just an ordinary man doesn't even refer to himself as a prophet, but God has chosen him to deliver a powerful message. And this message is one of judgment against the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. In our passage today, we're going to focus primarily on his message to the southern kingdom of Judah. Chapter 3, we'll cover that. All the way to chapter 6 and 7, we'll cover 
Judah. So although he's writing to both, the majority of the bulk of his prophecy is to the uh, southern kingdom. And that's because the northern kingdom, they will receive their judgment in his prophecy. They will be wiped out. The southern kingdom will have a remnant of people that will be left. So he's speaking to those uh, to that situation there. So let's give a little backdrop of what's happening. Uh, he's an eighth century prophet. The first half of the eighth century, Israel, the whole Israel, northern and southern kingdoms are doing well. Assyria, that power, that evil power that we have talked about so much is lurking in the background. It has taken a little hiatus. It's, it is uh, taking a little bit of break. It has allowed uh, Judah and Israel the southern and northern kingdoms to become very wealthy and very powerful. Uh, and like I said in the beginning, uh, it sounds very good that they're prospering and doing well. Uh, money is not the problem. It's their attitude and, and how they achieve their money is the problem. Uh, they are living this money and this materialism. They've got it through ill means. They've got it through oppression, taking advantage of people and God is not happy with that. So that's one of the things that Mike is going to speak about. But there's a lot of things that's happening in the northern and southern kingdom that's together. Idolatry is a problem, and God hates idolatry. Uh, there is uh, a seizing of land from the poor. In other words, God meant for land, if you look at the year of Jubilee, land was supposed to stay in that family's uh, line from generation to generation, so they would always have wealth. It wouldn't be the, the upper middle class and the lower middle class and then, a, uh, then the middle class. It would be people would at least have value of their land and therefore it kept the economic status of the people relatively the same. Yes, you had some rich people and poor, but generally people had land and that land meant, they gave, meant that they had an opportunity to generate wealth. So by the rich seizing that land, either conning them um, out of court, uh, getting them in debt, doing all those type of things, it created an imbalance and it allowed the rich to start oppressing the poor instead of being a community as one. It was an upper class, lower class, and then yes, there were a middle class, so the rich was taking advantage of it. Then there was uh, religious, um, I'll say mockery. I'll say this because these nations adapted the practices of their enemies. Uh, we will find out that they talked about child sacrifice, they worshiped their gods, but on the Sabbath, they would come to the temple and they would, or the tabernacle, and they, and they would um, worship gods. They would put on a facade, but yet would go back and adopt the practices of their enemies. Uh, materialism has brought about greed. If we were to look some more, they had problems with religious leadership. Uh, they were not, the priests were not the godly priests they were supposed to be. The prophets, they had prophets with the prophets. They were not prophesizing in the manner in which they would. I'm going to go in more detail uh, in this here. Uh, it, it wasn't a, a holy religious establishment. It was establishment on the religious level and the prophetic level, one of materialism. You you had to buy uh, your prophecy. You had to buy the blessing from the priest. And so that's something that God did not want. Some of the other things that the Bible is telling us about, they had an a, a unusual view, a bad theology when it came to uh, sacrifice. They felt that their giving of God material sacrifice could was pleasing to God without them having to obey God. Or they thought that their material sacrifice to God will prevent God from his, having a wrath on them, or it would be pleasing to God. They felt that they can please God by giving God material things. So they had a uh, mixed up theology. A lot of things were going on. It was immorality going on. It was a terrible place. It was just Everything against God was happening there. And so God has to send a prophet to pronounce judgment on both the northern and southern kingdom of Israel, has to do that. And so when we go to chapter one, we find out that the, the judgment is being uh, 
produced by uh, MICA uh, as we go to, uh, and it's speaking really gear, uh, toward northern Israel, but it's also speaking to Judah. As we move on, the message goes from the Israel to Judah in particularly. We go to chapter two, the message is primarily to Judah. And then when we get to chapter three, uh, the message is exclusive, exclusively to uh, Judah. Chapter two, Micah uh, uh, put, puts judgment on the oppressors that are oppressing the poor. Chapter one talks about the coming destruction that will come, that will just completely wipe them out. He outlines a case on why it's coming. And chapter three, Micah, where we're at today, he's going to put a judgment or a uh, he's going to indict the rulers and prophets. So let's get into what's happening there. Let's look at chapter three, verse one through four. And he said, and I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. It's talking about Judah pretty much in particular. Israel's guilt, Northern Kingdom's guilty too, but this is really geared toward Judah. Is it not for you to know justice? He's asking them, do you not know justice? Do you think you can live a life without justice? Now, what is justice? Justice is treating people fairly. So what he's accusing them of is not treating people fairly. The uh, rulers, the political leaders, the prophets, those in religious leadership, they were oppressing the poor. The very people that they were supposed to help they were now oppressing and mistreating them and not treating them fairly. Look what it says after in verse two, you who hate good and love evil. These religious leaders, these religious rulers, these prophets, they were supposed to do good. They were supposed to hate evil, but their lifestyle was the opposite. It would seem as though they hated doing good and loved doing evil because of all the wealth and greed that, that they were accumulating. They were obsessed with materialism. Again, I am not saying being wealthy and powerful in a position is a bad thing, but I'm saying that it can be a dangerous thing if God is not number one in your life. It will take you places where you don't want to go. It will cloud your way of thinking. It will affect, it can have an effect on how you treat people. And that's what's happening here. They wanted more and more. Let's see how bad they were treating the lower class, the middle class of the people. He says, you tear the skin off of my people. Now this passage right here is, is similar to how you would skin an animal and cook an animal. So as I read it, I want you to imagine that Micah is telling them they're treating them like animals that are about to be eaten. They're not treating them like persons and people of dignity. They're not treating them persons. They're treating them um, brutally, horrifically, they're tormenting their acts of violence. They're treating them terribly. Who tears the skin off my people, tear the skin off an animal and their flesh from the bones, just like you would do a chicken, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin off of them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a chowdron. Chowdron. What is he saying there? They mistreated them in the worst possible ways. They were physically abusive. They tormented them. They had no mercy. They had no kindness, no compassion. The thing that they were supposed to be like, kindness, love, gentleness, they were the exact opposite, and they abused and mistreated the people, and God did not like that. The wealth, the those in religious positions, those in prophetic positions, those who claim to know God, God had blessed them in a position of privilege, a position of power to do some good, and they were doing the opposite. No care for the orphan, no care for the, for the widow, no care for the stranger, none of that, no compassion. They took advantage of them as they would do an animal that they were skinning alive and preparing to eat and devour. So they were devouring them. That's how bad they were. But I'm going to read verse four, and I want to say, I want to hear what God's response to it. Not in our passage, but I think it's important. 
He says, then they will cry out to the Lord. When that judgment comes, they'll cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his faith from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. God is not happy. A lot of times the rich, we think the rich, not we, but the rich can think that they can get away with stuff. They can treat somebody any kind of way. And it seems that like nothing's going to happen to them. But this tells us that when you treat somebody wrongly, mistreat them, abuse them, uh, mistreat them in the worst kind of way, God is watching. And when that judgment comes against you, he's going to turn a deaf ear. He's not even going to look at you. So this applies to the nation of Judah, but it ha it's on a personal level because it's how people treat one another. It says, is it not for you to know justice? They don't know justice. They don't know how to treat. They do not know how to treat people fairly. And you got to remember that. That's what God cares about. It's one of the most important things that he cares about is how we treat our fellow neighbor. Let's remember that as this lesson goes on. Let's look at chapter nine. In that chapter nine, excuse me, verse nine. He says, hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob. Hear this, leaders of the house of Jacob, rulers, those in positions. Uh, the heads can mean not only leaders, but it really speaks to judges. So we have judges and leaders. And, and the Bible says here, Micah says, who detest justice, hate justice and make crooked all that is right. They take something that's good, the law, something that's moral, and they make that law immoral. They abuse it and they make it crooked for their selfish gain. Uh, a judge is supposed to render fair judgment. Micah says the judge detests justice. So in the courtroom, the poor person cannot get justice. Somebody takes his land, he goes to court, and he can't get a fair trial. In fact, that land is taken away from him. His home is taken away from him. His wages are taken away from him. People mistreat him and there's no recourse. He has no recourse and they're operating in such a way as if they detest justice because they do. And then you have the rulers are the, the leaders of the house of Israel. They're supposed to lead the people. They're, put, they're in political positions. They're in positions of power. They are uh, put there to look, to do, represent the people and do what's on their best behalf, but they're not. They're doing things on their best behalf. They're taking bribes. They're, they're selling out. They're making deals all at the expense of the poor person. So we got to be careful when we, want that money so bad, we can want it so bad, and we never really get enough. Uh, I think it was um, a Eisenhower, somebody uh, said, well, how much is enough? Uh, it was a rich person, it might not have been Eisenhower, but a rich person, how much is enough? Just one more dollar. And that's what's happening here. They are wealthy beyond belief, but yet they want some more. And that crave for money, that greed for money will cause you, if you don't have that solid relationship with God, it will cause you to mistreat people and rationalize it, and you think you're doing something that's right. You justify it somehow, and that's what's happening here. And make crooked all that is straight. They're breaking every rule to get over what they want, to get what they want. It says, and these same leaders, these same judges, they built Zion. They built Jerusalem with blood, meaning all the big buildings that you see in Jerusalem doing this prosperous time, all the monuments, all the nice houses, that was built with blood on the backs of the poor people by taking advantage of them. And God sees all this. He says, and Jerusalem with iniquity, they built Jerusalem with all type of immorality, idolatry, all those type of bad things. God sees it and God has had enough. A lot of times we take advantage of God's patience, but there's a time when God's patience runs out. And when it runs out, you are in some serious trouble. It is too late. And that's what's happening here. He said, it's his, meaning that it's judges gave judgment for a bribe. This is what they did. A judge, you go to a judge when you have a legal problem. But here it says, it is, it's judges gave judgment for a bribe. The only way you can see a, a judge 
uh, was to give a bribe. The only way you can win your case was you have to give a bribe. And guess who had all the money? It was the rich people. The poor people did not have a chance to give justice. And then it says, it's priest teaches for a price. You go to uh, a priest for religious matters, to hear, to, 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 for teachings. And yet the priest in the temple at this time, they were charging people to hear their words. They were charging people to come into the temple. They were take, they were profiting uh, by uh, by their through their ministry, immorally, unethically, going against everything. And so this is what they were doing there. All the religious practices, all the blessings that they had, they people had to pay for that. So it was a culture of materialism, a culture of money at any cost. And this is what their downfall was. They had no justice. They did not treat people fairly. It did not represent God. Then it said, if prophets practice divination for money, you go to a prophet to hear a word from God. You go to a prophet for uh, uh, advice to understand what you're going through. And just like a fortune teller, you have to pay to get a word from God. And any word that you have to pay to get a word from God, it was not a word. So they were paying, people were paying for a word that was not from God. And then you got these same people, the judges, the priests, and the prophets, yet they lean on the Lord and say, isn't that the Lord in the midst of us? They would have thought they were, they would tell you they were doing the right thing. They would tell you all of this is from God. Sometimes when our greed and our materialism, it will distort our thinking. It will confuse us. It will make us think what we're doing is, is uh, what's right, what's wrong is right. And what other people do what is good, we'll, make, we'll, we'll think that that somehow is evil. And that's the problem there. It says no, and then, and then the people will say, no disaster shall come upon us. They think that they are living the way God wants them to live. They think their money, their wealth is evidence of God's blessing. And they say to themselves, no disaster will come upon us. Meaning that God loves us. Look what he's doing in my life. He's going to protect us from our enemy. He's allowing us to prosper. Nothing can happen to us. And how far could that be from the truth? God has not done anything. God's patient. They take it for weakness. They have overestimated themselves and underestimated God. And when that happens, trouble's right around the door. Look what he says here. God responds to that. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. It will be torn from the floor. It will be broken down. Remember, uh, Judah's going to come. That, the Babylonians are going to come. They're going to straight out flatten, flatten that territory, flatten that land, that temple that was built by Solomon, it's going to be in total rubble. It says, Jerusalem shall come a heap of ruins, the capital city. It will, it will be so bad, it will take Israel, Jerusalem, years to recuperate, years to build that thing back up. In fact, it was, I don't know if, I don't know if they ever truly financially recover from that. That's how bad it will be. And the mountain of the house of the wooden height, that will come down. All these mountains that you see that are way up there, big on, they will come down and be in ruins. God's going to take care of them. But in the midst of this, I want to bring this up. This is not in the lesson, but in chapter five, God's not, he's going to destroy or really um, take the northern kingdom off of existence, but the southern kingdom, he's going to preserve a, rem a remnant. And that remnant is going to be one that's going to come out of exile, come out of Babylon, and they're going to begin to join the other people, the few people that remain, and they're going to start rebuilding it. But the promise is, is this, and this is very prophetic. This is some 700 years before the birth of Christ. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth to me, one who's to be the ruler of Israel, who is coming forth from an old, from ancient days. He gets to Micah, this minor prophet, he gets to pro prophet, prophesize a major thing, the coming of Jesus Christ.
being, look what it says. But are you, O Bethlehem? This, this ruler is coming out of Bethlehem, and that's Jesus Christ, the Savior, the ruler of Israel, who's coming. Micah prophesies the coming of Jesus Christ. So let's go to chapter 6, and let's look at, we're going to look at verses um, 6 through 8, but in order to do that, we got to look at chapter 1 through 5. That's going to set up what's happening in 6 through 8. What's happening in chapter 6, the Lord is making an indictment against Judah. In other words, he's bringing charges against Judah. And he says, Judah, this is what you're guilty of. Let me hear your response. How are you going to respond to what I'm saying? I'm indicting you. I'm putting these charges on you. Let me hear what you have to say. I'm going to say what I have to say. Then I want you to come back and respond to what I have to say. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to have the final word and respond in totality. He says, verse 1, hear what the Lord says. Arise and plead your case before the mountains and the hills. Hear your voice. In this jury system, the jury is going to be the mountains and it's going to be the voice. They, they, they're going to be witnesses to what's going on. Uh, they're going to hear everything. And so here are the mountains, the indictment of the Lord and your enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. God is laying his case out. The uh, mountains and the hills are going to be witnesses to what God has to say. And, this, and God's, God is, you know, God is saying, He's going to lay this out. And, and God is a compassionate guy. He doesn't want to bring judgment on anybody, but he asks him these rhetorical questions, these penetrating questions to Israel. And he's saying that, oh, my people, what have I done to you to deserve all of the idolatry, the abuse of one another, the violence, the uh, 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 the religious practices that are unholy, the, the bribery, all that's going on, the, the uh, fake uh, worship that you're giving me. What have I done to you to deserve all of this? It's like a, a, a wayward child and a parent says, I raised you the best way I could. I gave you this, this, and that. What did I deserve for you to treat me this way? You are shaming with your, with, with your actions. You are shaming me. I am uh, angry by what you've done. What have I done? I've been so good to you. And you, the child, will sit there and and they won't be able to say a word. And Israel can't really say a word. Have I worried you? Have I burdened you? Have I been pressing you on your neck uh, real hard? Have I bothered you? Have I nagged you? The answer is no. Answer me. For I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I, you were in bondage for 400 years. I heard your cries. I heard your moans. I heard you cry out night after night. And I answered your prayers. I sent a deliverer in the name of Moses. And I allowed him to bring you out of Israel out of bondage in your dire need. I redeem you from the house of slavery. I gave you grace and I gave you mercy. I brought you into the promised land. What have I done to you? And then he said, I sent you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. I sent you a lawgiver to tell you how to live before me. I sent you a teacher to tell you more about me. I sent you a priest to set up religious practices on how you can worship me and know me better. I sent you Miriam, who was a prophetess and a poet, so that you can go to and, and, and hear a word from the Lord on a personal level. I Look what I've done to you, done for you. And my question is, what have I done to you? I've been all good to you, and yet you treat me this way. It says, oh, my people, remember Balak, the king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, the son of Bor, answered him. Balak was supposed to, they got together, they wanted the prophet Balak to uh, curse Israel. And what happened here, when he was about to curse Israel, God jumbled his voice, his voice, his words up, and he ended up blessing Israel. And what that means is that God was protecting them. Not that that curse couldn't happen, wouldn't have been any good without God, but God showed them that he's in control. Instead of him cursing him, God turned into a blessing. And what happened uh, when you crossed the, the Jordan River? Oh, I, I allowed you to go from this side of the river to that side of the river 
on dry ground. Look what I did for you. That you may know the righteous acts of God. Every, that means the righteous acts of God. That means God says, everything I did for you was good. Everything I did for you blessed you. I showed you grace and mercy. I've been good to you. And my question is, what have I done to deserve this type of treatment that you've given me? What have I done? Now we can go to chapter verse six. And, and, and the, the, the caption is, what does the law require? That's key. But this is what their response is. They, they see that God is, is upset. They see what's going on. And they think, what can I do to please God? What can I do? But a lot of, see, a lot of people think that we can go from being religious to being non-religious and go back from non-religious to being religious, back and forth. But we cannot do that. So how we live our lifestyle says a lot about what we think about God or what we don't know about God. And what I'm trying to say here, they can't all of a sudden turn on their religious practices and make it be authentic. Look what comes out their mouth. Look what that the, was at their own heart. With what should I come before the Lord? They're asking myself and bow myself before the God. God, I know you're on high. I know you to be exhausted, exalted. But what can I bring before you that will be pleasing to you? That's what they're asking. Shall I come before you with burnt offerings? I mean, I can, can I make a, a, a sacrifice that is pleasing to you, that has that aroma that's found in, uh, I think it's Genesis 8, when Noah came out of the um, ark and he, and he, and he lit a, uh, did an altar and that burnt offering was a, a sweet aroma that was a pleasing to God. Can I do that? Uh, with a calf, a year old, a most prized possession, a valuable calf. Can I do that? Can I offer the best calf I have and please you that way? Will the, if I can't do that, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams and with ten thousand of rivers of oil? Can I uh, almost like a hyperbole, thousands of rams and ten thousand of rivers of? Will that please you? Look what he's doing. He's up in the ante. They're up in the ante. Judah's up in the ante each time, thinking that the more they give God, the more he will be pleased with them, and maybe this wrath will go away, and God will be happy with them. But that's not true. And then so after the oil and the rams, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now look at this right here. Burn offering, they think that I can make a sacrifice that pleases God. Uh, David said, I will not sacrifice anything that costs me nothing. And then he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. So what is God looking for? He's, when, when you do wrong, he's not looking for ritual acts. He's not looking for that. He's looking at what's in the heart. And what they've shown us so far, they want to offer God something materially. God doesn't need it. He doesn't want it. He's not saying that a burnt offering is not good, but if the heart ain't right, it means nothing to him. If there's no obedience behind his sacrifice, if it don't really cost you anything, then he doesn't really want it. Uh, a ten, you can in ten thousand of a thousand rams and ten thousand river oils. If your heart's not right, you can you can quadruple that. You can multiply that by ten times, and God still would not be pleased. And then you shall I give my firstborn of my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. When I saw this, that hurt me. It upset me because one of the things that God detests was human sacrifice, the sacrifice of a child to a God. That was something that the their enemies, those foreign nations practiced, was sacrifice. Ahaz did that because he... Uh, Assyria, he, he uh, sacrificed, he burned up his son trying to please God. And that's wrong. God specifically said there will be no child sacrifice. There will be no human sacrifice. And yet here it tells me they don't even know God. They know nothing about him. They are far away from God. It's east from west because they want to give God their firstborn in payment of their sin, of their soul. And if they knew God, they knew that God would, that would be the last thing that they wanted. The lack, their greed, the way they treated people, 
their lust for more had separated them from God. It has, this right here convicts them. They're thinking they're doing something they can appease God, but it actually convicts them in the court of law that they're guilty as charged because they don't even know anything about the God that they serve. That upset me when I saw that. To the holy God that we serve, to the righteous God that we serve, how could we think about sacrificing our firstborn child to a holy and righteous God? Just doesn't make sense. Look what God says right here. This is what God wants from them. This is what God wants from you and from me. This is a classic passage in here. The other one out of chapter five, this one and that one. To quote it countless times. Put on plaques countless times. This is what God wants. He has told you, oh man, what is good? I mean, God has told you in the law, in Deuteronomy, in the 10 commandments, what he expects from you, what is right. He wants you to live by his statutes and commandments. Here it says here, God has told you, oh man, what is good and what is required of you. They have, but they had got so caught up in the world, they don't even know what God wanted. They didn't even know what was required. That lets you know they were not studying God's word. They had no relationship with God. They had no fellowship among the believers. They, the word, wherever was being preached in the, in, the, in the synagogue, in the temple, was incorrect. And what God requires of them and what God requires of us, but to do justice, treat people fairly. Do what is right by one another. To love kindness. Be faithful to one another. Be faithful to other people. Show compassion to other people. Some versions say mercy. When someone is in need, help them out. The widow, the orphan, the stranger. Don't take advantage of them. Show compassion. And to walk humbly before, to walk humbly with your God means to live in a way that God would want you to live. Live in a way that is pleasing to God. Do justice. Treat others fairly. To love kindness. Be compassionate and merciful to other people, especially the people in need. And to walk humbly with your God. Walk in a way that God would want you to live. That's all he wants. If you do that, you will live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, it requires that you, in order to do this, you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and equips you to do this. We just have to yield to him. But if you want to know what God's will for your life is, do justice. Not only just uh, treat others fairly, but when you see a wrong being done, do something about it. Say something about it. Be proactive. Be uh, uh, Practice justice on a corporate level and a personal level. Uh, show compassion and mercy. Someone in need, someone may have done you wrong. Instead of striking back at them, give them a sense of compassion. Be forgiving. Be merciful. Be, uh, James talks about if you want mercy, you got to show mercy. So if you want mercy reciprocated in your life, be a merciful person. And then walk humbly. Acknowledge God's will in your life, what God wants you to do, how you want it to live. He's the only God. He Divide. He wants us to live upright and righteous. He wants us to live holy. He wants to have us to have sexual purity, no idolatry, no materialism. He wants us to uh, love one another, he wants us to love him only. All those things that he wants us to do. So what can we learn from this? Is that we have to make sure that when God blesses us, power, money, wealth, whatever it may be, position, make sure we treat other people fairly. Make sure we don't lose sight of God. Make sure that we're always unjust. Make sure we're always merciful. And make sure we're always living 
according to the commandments and statutes of God. In other words, we're living the way God wants us to live. We're living in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're living in the likeness and the image of Jesus Christ. I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. Again, I appreciate it very much. Hit the like button, hit the share button. If you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. I will see you next week. Remember what God requires us to do, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. We won't go wrong with that. We'll receive nothing but blessings. May God bless you. Love you much.